guys yo welcome back hope you guys are doing great so guys we're gonna be checking out this video this video actually went viral in america and people are really silent about it he's saying that right now he's not a muslim and he's going to tell us the reason why he took that decision so let's check it out guys As with all of my other claims about why I don't subscribe to a particular worldview or a particular creed, in this case Islam, the point for me is to explain why I'm unconvinced by certain claims rather than to provide a scholarly assessment of those claims. So I'm certainly open to correction and refutation of my arguments as I like to treat these opportunities the way I would if I was having a conversation with someone rather than some kind of indifferent denunciation of something that I disagree with. I also think it's really important to make a distinction between a creed and an adherence of a creed or a belief and a believer. In criticizing Islam, I'm criticizing a creed and not people. I know that when certain people, especially of my my particular pigmentation, uh, make commentaries like this or describe things in this way, they're often accused of things like racism. Well, a creed isn't a race. In the same way that people can criticize Christianity, in fact, I welcome criticism of Christianity because it invites the opportunity to explore and to discuss the things that I believe to be true. I'm so confident in my beliefs that I think that they will actually stand up to that kind of scrutiny, which is why I welcome it. So with all of that said, my immediate abbreviated answer for why I'm not a Muslim is because I'm a Christian. And I think as any Muslim would agree, the two are incompatible. And also, I think it's important for me to say that I'm not a Christian because I was raised as a Christian, but because I converted to the Catholic Church in my young adult years. And that conversion followed a pattern something like this. I would learn a little bit about Christianity, and then I would respond with, okay, that's interesting. I'd like to learn more. And so I would. And at every interval of that process, I found satisfaction for my inquiry. So you fast forward several years later, and I'm still learning and still growing in satisfaction with everything that I learned. Conversely, with Islam, I can't say that I have a studied or a comprehensive knowledge, and certainly not a firsthand knowledge of the religion, because every time I've had some exposure to it, it didn't compel me to respond to it the way that I did with Christianity. Instead of saying, that's interesting, I wanna learn more, I had something of an opposite reaction to it. So in explaining why I don't find the claims of Islam compelling enough for me to want to immerse myself in it more, let alone practice it, it's helpful for me to contrast it with Christianity in my explanation. And there are three areas I would wanna focus that attention on. They're on the founder of each tradition, so that would be Jesus and Muhammad, on the rival conceptions of God. They're both monotheistic religions, but Christianity describes God as a trinity. And on the Quran versus the Bible, the two competing scriptures. So let's start with the central founding figures of each faith tradition in Islam. Uh, Muhammad is described as a prophet, and in fact, they go far as to say that he's the last prophet, after which no more revelation is to take place. And in an attempt to evaluate that, I think it's probably worth trying to define what a prophet is and what we should expect from a prophet. And I don't think that my definition would be particularly unique. I would say that a prophet is a messenger from God who reveals something important about God and points us beyond this life to our fulfillment in another. And the reason that I say that they point us to something beyond is because the mere fact that we have prophets and apparently need prophets tells us that we are estranged from God. And if we weren't, he wouldn't need to send messengers in our midst as a kind of espionage towards our rebellious condition. If we weren't estranged from God, he would just communicate with us directly. So because of that definition and what we think of as the role of prophet in evaluating someone who claims to be a prophet, we should expect to encounter someone who directs our attention towards a different kind of life, one that is markedly distinct from the kind of life that we try to make for ourselves here and now without prophetic guidance. I think that this should be readily apparent in both their teachings and the witness of their lives. There should be something about them that forsakes the trappings of this life and instead invests in the one beyond. And by the trappings of this life, I mean that a prophet should be indifferent towards things like money, power, pleasure, and sensuality. 
I don't need someone who isn't me to tell me I should pursue those things. Every corrupted instinct I have already tells me to go after those things and to set my heart upon them. I would expect a prophet to tell me to aim for something other than what my most base desires are already telling me. But in the case of Muhammad, at least by his example, we have someone who seemed to invest significant effort into acquiring wealth, honor, power, and sensuality. He literally raised an army to himself. He fought battles and killed people. And he reaped the kinds of rewards that virtually every well-known warlord in history seeks for themselves. And in so doing, he seemed to conduct himself the way that a typical warlord would do. He executed prisoners of war who had surrendered. He took and sold slaves, including women and children. He took many wives for himself, including one that was so young that the Hadith said that she still played with dolls. In her own words, in her own testimony in the Hadith, it says that she was six when they married and nine when he consummated that marriage. Jesus Christ, by contrast, seems to forsake the things of this life in teaching and example. He tells us to avoid storing up treasures in this life, which will only decay and end up being confiscated in the end anyways. Instead, he says that we should store up treasure in heaven by doing God's will. The Bible depicts Jesus as someone who fasts, who deprives himself of the luxuries of this world, who prays all night long, who performs miracles, who identifies with the lowest members of society, who protects children, and who is indifferent towards honor, wealth, and power. Whereas Muhammad, by contrast, he does not perform miracles. He rules over the lowly. He apparently uses children instead of protects them. Mm. And he grasps at honor, wealth, and power using all of his might to get those things, which again is no different from hundreds of other powerful figures from history who have had those things in reach. So what makes him different? Again, this is me asking that question to someone on the outside looking in. What should compel me to want to learn more about him? What makes him different? What makes him someone who points us beyond this life instead of all the things that my heart already desires in this life? In the case of Jesus, not only are his teachings unique and the kind of thing that I would expect from a true prophet, but I also find the, cl the claims about him to be very compelling, especially his resurrection as it is attested to by his followers. As I've argued in other videos, so I won't spend a lot of time on it here, the followers of Jesus either witnessed his resurrection from the dead or they lied about it. If they lied about it, then the surest test of that lie is the threat of severe punishment or even death if they hold to it. And in the case of the apostles of Jesus, all of them except for one were threatened with death if they did not recant their claims about him returning from the dead. And nobody would die for a lie, especially when they have nothing to gain and everything to lose. And yet, that's exactly what they did when every single one of them was put to that test. Again, a prophet is someone who brings us some revelation about God, the afterlife, or ultimate reality, these big questions. And in the case of God, we're talking about one who is supreme, perfect, all-knowing, yeah. almighty, and wholly other than us. He isn't a figment of our imag imagination. His being doesn't arise from us, but rather we arise from his creative act. Um, so what I would expect from a prophet's message about God is something at least somewhat surprising because I'm not those things. I'm not perfect. I'm not all powerful. I'm not all knowing. So when I encounter one who is, it should be surprising being so distinct from me. And if someone comes to me with a message that sounds familiar and unsurprising, then my first instinct is to assume that the message that they are carrying is coming, isn't coming from another world, but from the one the plain old obvious one I currently inhabit. And I don't need a prophet to tell me about that. But the message of Jesus is full uh. of surprises, even to a world that has been hearing that message for over 2000 years now. But in a world in which those teachings were new, the world that he lived in, they weren't, they weren't just new, they were shocking to many of the people that heard them. Before Jesus, nobody thought it was a noble thing to identify with the poor, the sick, the lame, and the orphaned. Those conditions were seen as evidence of divine disfavor, and there's certainly nothing rational about blessing and helping those who can't return the favor. Jesus was the first to insist on this and the first to tie it back to the will of God. Perhaps one of the most surprising things uh, that Jesus in the Bible reveals to us 
us about the nature of God is God as Trinity. And interestingly enough, there's this seems to be a point that many Muslims, especially those commenting on my own videos, seem to grab onto as an obvious weakness in Christian theology. But I think the reverse is strongly, strongly implied here. A non-Trinitarian formulation of God is actually a weakness if you want to try to say the kinds of things that Islam does apparently say about God. For example, one of the names of God is Al-Wadud in, in Islam, which means all loving. To say that God is all loving means that this is something that you can always ascribe to him and that it doesn't require us to have been created for him to be described in this way. If it did, then you'd be conceding that God's love is contingent upon us existing and therefore we would be needed for God to be what he is. But how can someone who is all loving, all powerful and utterly self-sufficient require us to exist to be what he is? that is all loving. And this raises a big difficulty in the, the Islamic conception of God. Because before God created us, how could you say that he was all loving? Love after all means to will the good of another. To love means to focus your attention on someone who is not yourself. And if God is the only one who existed from all eternity, then how could he love someone else from all eternity? The Christian understanding of God solves this by telling us that within the divine being are three distinct persons who are a perpetual exchange of love from all eternity while sharing in one divine nature. Thus, one divine nature or one God and three persons to fulfill the nature of God which is love. A God who existed by himself from all eternity cannot be said to be all loving unless there was an object of love from all eternity as well. And in the Christian tradition, that is inherent in the divine nature. And since in the Islamic conception of God, there isn't, we can't ascribe love as part of the divine nature in that system. Now, what about the two contrasting scriptures? Of course, in Christianity, we have the Bible, which is often thought of as a single book, but in reality, it's a library or a canon of books written over the course of, some say over 1500 years by dozens of authors. And yet, in spite of that vast separation of space and time, those same authors managed to somehow coordinate a, co a coherent system of thought that finds its fulfillment in the life and teachings of Jesus. Some scholars estimate that Jesus fulfills over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. As I argued in another video, a conspiracy to coordinate an effort to develop a scripture like that, drawing from multiple generations of people on multiple authors of that length of time that coheres in the life and teachings of Jesus, I mean, that's impossible. But a book that is written by one person over a short length of time and claims to be the be all end all of revelation, well, that's much easier to ascribe to a conspiracy or to a just a simple deception. The more I learned about the Bible as a young convert, the more it interested me. But the Quran, on the other hand, at first glance, it's written by one person. I mean, it's the kind of thing that is just very easy to dismiss as something other than a true revelation. The Bible can also lay claim to being the origin of most of what we think of now as monotheism and an ethical system that is inseparable from the ethical DNA of even the modern world. The Quran, by contrast, it doesn't introduce us to anything compelling that wasn't already in the Bible. If anything, it just rolls things back to much of what had already been described in the New Testament, some 2,000 years before Muhammad. Now, some people will object and say that if we're going to be wary of Muhammad because he was a warlord, because he did things like kill people and buy and sell slaves and indulge in sensuality and, and the trappings of wealth and power and everything else, then we should also hold Moses and Joshua, Saul and David in suspicion as well. The distinction here, first of all, starting with the fact that Moses wasn't a warlord himself. He didn't fight in battles. He was just a prophet. But the other distinction here is that revelation, that is the way that God reveals himself to us, is something that happens progressively. Just like any form of education, which reveals knowledge progressively and iteratively, if you want to learn to, let's say, read or write or do math, you start with the alphabet or just your basic sums. That's the first lesson, but you shouldn't be satisfied with that first lesson because it's only a step to the fulfillment that an educated person should expect. What the Bible depicts is a progression in those lessons 
in Revelation, starting with prophets like Moses. That's an introductory revelation of God. If you left it at that, you'd be like a kid who only knows the alphabet. You have to move on to fully fleshed grammar. The last lesson in the curriculum of the revelation of God is Jesus. If Moses claimed to be the final and fullest revelation of God, then I would be a little bit wary and skeptical of him too, but he doesn't. He tells us that one day God will raise up a greater prophet than him. And if all Muslims can do is say that Muhammad is no better than Moses, then that gives me reason to look elsewhere. Because according to Islam, Muhammad's revelation is the final one. It's the last lesson in the curriculum, but it's no more morally or spiritually rich than the first revelation of God some 2,000 years before Muhammad in the Old Testament. In other words, it's a primitive take on God which had already been well established and known. Prophets are supposed to tell us something new that will lead us on, not repeat what had already been said 2,000 years before they were born. Ah, wow, wow, wow. I love how the man was able to, you know, dissect the whole thing. I love his explanation, him talking about Jesus and Muhammad, what Jesus did in the Bible, in Christianity, and what Prophet Muhammad did in the Quran. Like he said, this is why he was not really convinced to actually convert to Islam. is because he has, you know, searched deeper. He has tried to look at the two lives, like the, how they live their life, these two prophets, the one from the Quran, the one from the Bible, the prophet, which is Jesus, like the way he said about um, Prophet Muhammad, he said Prophet Muhammad, he noticed that Prophet Muhammad was uh, a man of war. He fought a lot of war. So he, he's trying to tell us that he's trying to get something from each prophet, some positive things that he can get from there. I noticed that there are a lot of positive things he has researched that he can get from Jesus during his time compared to Prophet Muhammad during his time. That was what he said. So that's why he said he doesn't see the need to convert to Islam because the fact that he's a Christian and he has been researching on Islam and he got to know that Islam does not really sit well with him because of so many facts he gathered from the Quran, especially about Prophet Muhammad. Because you notice that a lot of people have been asking him, why are you not a Muslim? That's why he decided to make this video and Wow, I know a lot of people might not agree to this and I don't want to say much about this because I don't really know much about Prophet Muhammad during his time. So and I'm sure this man did his research before coming out to say all these things and and I'm not trying to bring down any religion here, but I'm just trying to explain that this is why the man actually made up his mind that okay, this is the religion I'll keep following. So that's I kept on for you know going for uh, following Christianity. That's why he's finding it kind of difficult to convert. So yeah, so thank you so much for watching guys. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button for more. Like, share, and comment. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.